welcome to all of you, the people of God and leaders and representatives of the different churches who have come this evening to pray with us here in the upper room. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Brothers and sisters, let us prepare ourselves to pray together this evening for Christian unity.
during this week of prayer for Christian unity to listen to the Word of God and let it confront us. This year's theme is particularly challenging. It asks us to consider St. Paul's question to the Corinthians, has Christ been divided? Actually, the question was even more challenging because it was not just has Christ been divided, but is Christ divided? Paul's question was a rhetorical one, and he surely awaited the only answer that could be given. The answer, no. Christ never has, and never can be divided. There are two reasons for that. First, because as Byzantine Christians sing at every celebration of the Eucharist, Christ is one of the Holy Trinity. As the eternal Son of God, he is forever one with the Father and the Holy Spirit in the unity of their undivided divine nature. Even during the days of his earthly ministry, the incarnate Son of God proclaimed this unity, saying, I am not alone, for the Father is with me, and the Father and I are one. Second reason, Christ is also undivided in his human incarnation. As the Word made flesh and splendor of the Father, He is as perfectly one with us as He is perfectly one with God. His unity with the Father is mirrored in His unity with us, for He is as complete in His humanity as in His divinity. Just as He is eternally undivided from the Father, so He shares our human condition so fully that he enjoys undivided unity with us. He will never be separated from us in any way. Paul and John's great images of Christ as the head of his body, the church, and as the true vine of which Christians are the branches, express symbolically this basic truth of our faith. Yet, while we know that Christ is undivided, we also know, only too sadly, that we Christians are not. After all, that is why we gather to pray this week. The history of the church is full of schisms, divisions and persecutions, and not only here in the Holy Land. We all know that hatred, bitterness and division are still found even among those who profess to follow Christ. It is supremely ironic that anyone might hate, seek revenge, or even kill in the name of one who gave up his life so that the scattered children of God might be gathered into unity, and who asked the Father to forgive even those who nailed him to the cross. Yet, divisions are still among us today. Even if we have usually, though not always, stopped actively hating each other, we are still divided by doctrines and beliefs, and I think that is unlikely to change, at least during my lifetime. <laughs> How should we respond to this distressing fact? Should we just throw up our hands in despair and think that even God is unable to bring about reconciliation? Should we just live with the fact that however undivided Christ, the head, may be, his body, the church, is doomed to perpetual fragmentation. In other words, is Christ's body on earth doomed to division? Dear brothers and sisters, notwithstanding appearances to the contrary, may the same answer resound once more, never. Therefore, instead of falling into despair, let us go a little deeper in our reflections. Let the word of St. Paul, in its original context and in its original power, accompany us into those depths. When he wrote his letter to the Corinthians, exhorting them to resolve the divisions in their community, Paul named the two great realities at the heart of our Christian faith, the cross and baptism. 
For immediately after asking his first rhetorical question, is Christ divided? He asked two more. Was Paul crucified for you? And again, were you baptized in the name of Paul? Was Paul crucified for you? No. Jesus Christ and he alone was crucified for us. There is no other name given us under heaven by which we may be saved. Dying, he destroyed our death, and rising, he restored our life. The cross of Christ, that terrible instrument of torture, is God's remedy given us to heal all divisions and bring about unity in a broken world. For as the fathers of the Second Vatican Council declared, echoing St. Augustine, out of the wounded side of the Saviour on the cross, the wonderful sacrament of the whole church poured forth in blood and water. When we Christians forget that Golgotha was the place of the church's birth, when we are content to contemplate ourselves, when we forget to look on the one who has been pierced, then inevitably our unity falls apart and we dissolve into irreconcilable differences. Life is sacrificed to ossified structures and sacrificial love to death-dealing definitions. But despite our failure to stay with him where he was, despite our failure to glory in the cross, the unity Christ has already achieved on Golgotha has never been dissolved. It never can be and never will be for it is grounded in God. Let us return then at the end to the original question posed by Paul, is Christ divided? And let us proclaim again, no, never, not even in his earthly members. He is one and undivided, forever one and undivided. He is one with the Father and the Holy Spirit, he is one with us in our human nature. He is one with the universe. He is cleansed by his blood. He is one with his church, baptized into his death and resurrection. Ecclesiastical divisions, the sad heritage of Christian history, remain painfully obvious to us all. We must never cease to work and pray, to study and suffer, that mutual understanding may grow among us and communion be restored. But visible unity, that will come only insofar as we gather together around the primal font of unity, the Saviour lifted high on the cross. He is the divine magnet, drawing all things and everyone to himself, and deep into the heart of the Holy Trinity. To God our Father, through the open side of Christ our Saviour, in whom the already existing unity of Christians is there, waiting to be discovered. To him be the glory, now and forever, and to the ages of ages. Amen.
with our spirits to declare that we are children of God. <laughs>
I invite all the ordained ministers of the various churches to join with me spiritually in giving this blessing. The Lord be with you. Let us bow our heads and pray for God's blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Amen. May he let his face shine upon you and show you his mercy. Amen. May he turn his countenance towards you and give you his peace. Amen. And may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit come down on you and remain with you forever. Amen. Thanks be to God.